The fundamental building block of aerospace engineering is a wonderful piece of mathematics called the lift equation. The thing I love about this formula is how deceptively simple it is and how much it actually tells us about the physics of aircrafts. When this equation is taught to students for the first time, it's usually in the context of trying to solve some sort of problem. But in this video, I'd like to approach this super important formula from a different angle and explore its secrets by challenging the way that I used to think about the lift equation. The lift equation's older ancestor is this formula, which incredibly was used by the Wright brothers to design the world's first ever motor-operated airplane. By the time the Wright brothers started their studies, scientists were already hard at work trying to figure out what determines the amount of lift an object produces. Let's say you're driving a car along the motorway and you decide to stick your hand out of the window. You can imagine that you'll feel a force trying to push your hand in a certain direction depending on the angle it makes with the incoming air. Think about the properties of the air and the velocity of the car. What do you think will happen to the force on your hand as we increase the speed of the car? You would of course expect the force to increase, but by how much? Do you expect that by doubling the speed of the car, you'll also double the force on your hand? What early aerodynamicists figured out, even before the Wright brothers, was that lift is proportional to velocity squared. What this means is that if you double the velocity, you'll quadruple the lift. The reason behind this behavior is really fascinating and is something that I'll leave for you to research or think about since I don't want it to be the goal of this video. Another pretty obvious factor in determining lift is the area that you're exposing to the incoming airflow. If you'd make your hand twice as big, then you'd get twice as much lift, since it would be the same effect as just putting two identical hands next to each other. The same is of course true for a wing. If you make your wing twice as big, you'll get approximately twice as much lift. Okay, so now we've explained two of the elements in this equation. We know that lift will probably be a combination of speed and surface area, but you might guess that there's also more to the story here. Now I'd like to put our understanding to the test by actually using this formula to explain things we can see happening in X-Plane. From experience, I can see that there's a difference between seeing an equation and being able to make sense of it, and actually truly having an intuitive understanding of it. So to build our understanding here, what we're going to do is change each one of these variables one by one and see if the behavior that our flight simulator exhibits aligns with our theory. It's kind of difficult to change the area of the wing on the fly, but you can see that historically as aircraft got heavier, their wings got bigger proportionally, which makes a lot of sense. Here we're flying a 737 at 5000 feet at 250 knots true airspeed. Keep in mind that indicated airspeed, which we usually see in the cockpit, is different from the actual speed that we're flying through the air. But in this equation, V is the true airspeed of the molecules as they pass over the wing. For now, the aircraft is trimmed and we're flying in a straight line. If I suddenly increase the altitude to 10,000 feet and keep the true airspeed the same, what do you expect will happen? The simulator is paused right now and I'll unpause it in 3, 2, 1. We can see that the aircraft suddenly descends. So what's going on here and does this make sense given what we've just talked about? When the aircraft was flying straight and level in the original case, we know from Newton's laws that the total lift equals the weight of the aircraft. This is super important to understand and something you should keep in mind for the rest of the video. Now that we've increased the altitude and we observe the aircraft descending, this has got to mean that the lift of the wings has reduced. What's happening here is that the weight of the aircraft is getting the upper hand over the lift and therefore pulling the aircraft down towards the earth. The reason the lift is reduced must have something to do with the atmosphere because that is the only thing we've changed between the two situations. The air of course gets thinner as we get closer and closer to space, meaning that the air density is smaller in this equation. And since we haven't changed any of the other variables, this also means that the lift must be smaller. This is what's causing the aircraft to descend. We can perform a similar experiment to what we just did, where we trim the aircraft at a certain altitude. Now, let's increase the speed. As we'd expect, we can see the aircraft establishing itself in a climb. In this case, the opposite is happening of what we just saw, since an increase in velocity causes more lift, which results in a climb. Now I think we're ready to address the most difficult part of the lift equation. If you've used flight simulators before, you will of course know that we can increase the speed of the aircraft without starting a climb by compensating with the elevator and pitching the nose down. But wait a second, if we're increasing the speed, then surely the lift also increases, right? This is always what puzzled me about this equation, because during flight, all of these variables are constantly changing, and I always wondered how they all seem to magically fit together and adjust themselves automatically. 
So let's break down what's happening here as we increase the speed. A crucial insight to make is that as we're increasing speed, the lift of the aircraft will still equal the weight of the aircraft. This is again because of the fact that we're flying straight and level, and that there is no net force pulling us up or down. So even though we're adjusting the pitch to maintain level flight, we know that lift equals weight throughout our acceleration. And since we also know that the weight of the aircraft will stay more or less constant throughout this maneuver, we also know that the lift must also stay constant. Even though lift is constant, the velocity will be getting larger over time. This can only mean that there is something else in this equation which is getting smaller over time. You might have guessed that this has got something to do with this parameter here. For now we can call this mysterious factor CL or lift coefficient. So what we know about CL is that as speed goes up, it goes down. And as speed goes down, it goes up. But this only applies if the aircraft is flying in straight and level flight. Depending on how much you know about aircraft, you might have guessed that this parameter has got something to do with angle of attack. This brings me back all the way to the beginning of the video where I talked about the angle of the incoming air. This angle is the exact definition of angle of attack. So as the plane goes faster, you'll notice that both angle of attack and CL decrease as you can see happening here. And as the plane goes slower, angle of attack increases up to a certain point. At a certain critical angle of attack, the wing will start to stall, as it is unable to produce enough lift to keep the aircraft flying. This is where high lift devices such as flaps come into play. One way to think about these results is that when you're going fast, most of the lift is produced by velocity, whereas when you're going slow or low velocity, most of the lift is produced by angle of attack. And at each point in time, lift will always be a combination of angle of attack and velocity. But you can see that throughout this motion, the lift produced by the wings is constant. Now you may be wondering, well, why are we not just using alpha or angle of attack in the lift equation instead of CL? That's a fantastic question and something I'll talk about in the next video together with flaps and high lift devices. Something that took me years to figure out is that this coefficient really is at the heart of why airplanes can fly. In theory, you could apply this equation to any object whatsoever. But for example, if you'd apply it to a circle, CL would just turn out to be zero and therefore no lift would be produced. It just happens to be that we found a shape that is extremely efficient at producing an upwards force. In other words, it's got a big CL. You can also imagine that there is a huge ongoing effort to figure out how to design a wing so that we can optimize CL and minimize drag. Besides the surface area of the wing, CL is the only parameter that depends on the geometry of the aircraft, and is therefore something engineers can control and tweak by adjusting the aircraft's design. I want to ask you one final question to wrap this video up and really challenge your understanding of this. We've talked a lot about lift equaling weight during level flight, but I've always wondered how does this actually happen in practice? I mean, how does a wing know exactly how much lift it should produce? Can it somehow sense how heavy the aircraft is and then adjust itself automatically? This question strikes at the heart of aircraft stability and is massively linked to how angle of attack evolves dynamically over time. To answer it, we would need to consider how aircraft respond to disturbances over a certain time span, for example over the course of multiple seconds. Hopefully you learned something from this, and if you think I deserve it, please consider subscribing and liking the video. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see each other again soon.